Thank you, dear friends. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored, as has become reasonably traditional, if I may say so, uh, to inaugurate the uh, Biovision proceedings with uh, a technical presentation, uh, not just the words of welcome that I made at the beginning. And uh, today, I will speak about the knowledge revolution that we are living through. Uh, I will take you through these seven points, seven of everything, an introduction, changing world, the seven pillars of the knowledge revolution, and a few words about how we are addressing that in this rebirth of the Library of Alexandria or the Biblioteca Alexandrina. And the fact, as was mentioned by the, His Excellency the Governor, that we are living in a real revolution in Egypt. And then I would like to have a few words about science, Islam, and values. And the question of values and the values of science and what Islam has done in, for science throughout almost a thousand years and is doing again is something that we in Egypt should be knowledgeable about and proud of during this time of revolution. So these are, that's my outline, and as I go forward, as you will see these uh, red slides, you will know that I am moving chapter by chapter and getting uh, closer to ending so that those of you who want to go and have some dinner will be able to do so. So let me start and saying that I genuinely believe that we are living the third global revolution, and I believe that it is a very special revolution which I will mention right now. now. The first revolution was the revolution of agriculture and sedentarization. And that, of course, allowed human beings not just to be hunters and gatherers, and allowed surpluses to be created and civilizations to arise, mostly near the banks of rivers, both here and in what is now Iraq, and in China as well. The second global revolution was the industrial revolution which transformed modes of production and transformed the uh, uh, movement and trade of the world, and not just by inventing machinery, but also changed the relationship between the human being and the output of their work, where artisanship used to exist, where someone would produce a finished product. Human beings became specialists, working in a factory, each doing a particular job and the whole producing a product at the end. Now the third global revolution has been referred to variously as the information revolution and the knowledge revolution. I prefer the knowledge revolution, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but I think that this knowledge revolution is very profound. Where it used to be machinery and muscle, it is now the results of brain power that impact on all these outputs that we think of. And in fact, I would point out to our colleagues here that a tiny little country like Singapore as the second highest GDP per capita in the world with no resources, not even water, it has to distill water for drinking, it imports all of its food, but almost totally on the result of uh, scientific uh, uh, production. The revolution that we are living right now is just at the beginning. This is the end of the beginning. It is not anywhere near where it's going to take us. And it affects all aspects of science, technology, and innovation. So hence, we should recognize that in this field today, biology is taking enormous new steps. And we can genuinely believe that we are on the verge of an enormous transformation of the biological sciences and the impact of the biological sciences on our society and our living. I remember in 1997 when Dolly the sheep was first cloned, the late Dolly, Allah we, uh, we were friends as you can see. <laughs> uh, this was of course in the Rosley Institute in, in, in Scotland where I uh, visited with a number of scientists. Uh, she made a big impact, but it was uh, part of a step and a series of steps that are leading us all the way to where we are today. So there was a lot of media attention on that, but fundamentally the biological sciences 
are just beginning to come into their own. And uh, cell biology is being transformed. Professor Bruce Alberts gave me the fifth edition of his uh, great uh, work on cell biology, which will be added to us. And all of these biological sciences are going to open a lot of new doors in practically every field of human existence. Now, my colleagues throughout this conference will be addressing how all of this is linked to society in the areas of health, in the areas of agriculture and food, in the areas of environment and industry. But today, I will talk about something different. Today, I will talk about the knowledge revolution itself, not how knowledge in the biological sciences is going to impact this field or that, but how knowledge itself is being transformed because I think that within what we call this third global revolution, there is really a fundamental different revolution. And this comes from the fact that if you start with data, when you organize data, it becomes information. When you explain that information, it becomes knowledge. Now, how to use that knowledge in society, of course, hopefully requires wisdom. And wisdom is different from knowledge. It requires knowledge, but it is knowledge coupled with judgment and the patina of experience to arrive at an understanding of the consequences of the actions we take in the deployment of science and technology throughout our societies. It is an important classification that you see here. The great poet T.S. Eliot uh, wrote a century ago, where is the life that we lost in living where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? Sometimes you drown in information, but you don't have knowledge. And sometimes you have knowledge, but you lack wisdom. And uh, that, I think, is an important distinction that we want to come to later on. So with that as my setting, I will move to the fact of why I think we are living in a very changing world. A world that we all know has been transformed, really transformed profoundly, far more profoundly than anybody could imagine by the new information and communication technologies, the ICT world. But more importantly, I submit to you, and I will talk about the, the, the seven pillars in a moment, that we are going through a transformation that is more profound than anything we have lived through in knowledge throughout human history, I put it closer to the invention of writing. The invention of writing was essential to accumulate knowledge and to transfer knowledge across space and time intergenerationally. And uh, today, the scale of the revolution is of that size and magnitude. We know and feel that we have moved through the web. And the web initially was somebody produced something, posted it, somebody else read it. Now we are in web 2.0, where everybody is both a producer and a consumer of knowledge. But as we also know, the semantic web is under preparation. And that means looking at concepts, at relationships, and not just at objects of information as we search for that today. And that is part of this new transformation. Social connectivity is also being transformed. Who could have predicted the impact of Facebook 10 years ago? Not even Mark Zuckerberg himself who invented Facebook. So if you look at where we are, and this is nice work by Nova Spivak, uh, if you go on this side, the degree of information connectivity, you go from the web, which connects information, to the semantic web, which connects knowledge. And if you go on that side towards social connectivity, you go from the web towards social software that connects people, from connecting information to connecting people. Well, what's up here? And that's what she calls the meta web, and she refers to it as connecting intelligence. When you have a very high degree of connectivity at the level of knowledge and of people at the same time, advancing very rapidly and as we'll see involving other aspects involving everything from biorobotics to artificial intelligence we'll see but more change will be coming in fact right now they are already starting to use modulated light to send data 
And this creates an extremely efficient light-based internet system that allows about 10 gigabytes per second rates. Now, that uses a lot of LED light sources instead of the conventional fiber optics wiring. Now, that is enough to download the equivalent of a DVD movie, high definition DVD movie in 30 seconds, provided that there's a way of doing so legally, but that's another uh, question. But the, this shows you how this transformation is taking place. And beyond tomorrow, who knows? Who can say what is going to happen beyond right now? But what makes this knowledge revolution specific, unusual, and deserving of this label I've given it as the most profound transformation since the invention of writing are these seven pillars that I will present to you. The first of these is what I call parsing, which is how you divide things, life, living and dead knowledge, and the organization of knowledge itself. So throughout history, whether we were writing on tablets or scrolls or books, whether they were written as manuscripts or published, we parsed knowledge like bricks in a wall. We built an edifice, each work one step at a time, and we put books next to each other as the bricks of knowledge, so to speak, building the edifice of knowledge. Today, the, the parsing is done with websites, with pages, with web pages. Now, the distinction is very important because the question is whether it is dead or alive. What I mean by that is that if we hold two copies of a book and you look up page 157 and I look up page 157 and the first line in my book will be the same as yours and I can tell you, please look up such and such a book in such and such a place and you'll find it. And invariably, 10 years from now, we'll find it again, and 30 years from now, we'll find it again. And it shall be that way until there is a new edition of that particular book. On the other hand, if I tell you, look up such and such a website, by the time you go there, 10 minutes later, it may have changed. It may have been updated. It's a living, constantly being updated reality that is out there. And that's why we have our little robots that photograph all the pages on the web that we keep in the Internet Archive. So yesterday the documents were dead. Knowledge had a well-known structure. And uh, with the, today the document is alive and can be updated constantly. And the web page is the home page. And instead of presenting a material through introduction and uh, arguments and so on. We look through a site map, we search, we browse, etc., and we're already beginning to connect into that website images and video. And tomorrow, uh, the parsing, which has already been reduced by the web pages and hypertext, will become almost continuous, it'll be fluid. And uh, different concepts will emerge into the fiber of the text itself. 3D images will jump up and will become part of that. That is not far. That is right around the corner right now. Some of that already exists today. There will be advanced searchability for this material in different ways across the semantic web. And language will no longer be a barrier because it's, everything will be automatically translated into the language of your choice as you interact with this new web that's being done. So all of that is not that far away, and we can see it coming, and the transformation in the manner in which we produce and communicate knowledge and how we, we, we change that knowledge and how we search for it is going to change itself. So instead of the bricks and the parsing, instead of the few people talking to each other, instead of posting text on the web, we're really talking about a living, vibrant, changing, interconnected knowledge base that connects people throughout the planet because that is instantaneously happening. The science that is being discovered in China is known in Brazil, in South Africa, in Egypt, in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, all simultaneously. So imagine all of these, this enormous amount of information were being transformed all the time, living, pulsating, it is almost like one giant brain 
with neurons firing off in all directions across the whole planet. That's pillar number one of the seven pillars of this knowledge revolution. The second one is image and text. If you look throughout history, we have mostly relied on text rather than image, partly because it was difficult and expensive to produce images. But now everybody is photographing and posting and videoing and putting things on the web. And images call on different parts of our brain. Human brains are much, 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 much more efficient at the processing of images than they are on the processing of text. Uh, you can describe in great detail what this cone looks like, or you can look at the picture of the cone. And just imagine you open a door into a room and close it again. In that fraction of a second, your mind has captured a reality of that room. And you can say how big it is, approximately how many people were there, the carpets were this color, the, the ceiling was that color, there was a a chandelier, there was a table, or six people sitting there, two women, four men, there was uh, 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 something on the table or not, the table was made of wood or of metal. All of that, in a fraction of a second, has been captured and processed. Now imagine trying to communicate the same thing in text. The effort it takes is very different. But text uses a different part of our abilities. It has a three-layered level of abstraction. There is the abstraction of the letter itself. There is the abstraction of words, a word composed of letters, and there's abstraction of a sentence composed of words. And thus the reader, unlike the person who simply receives the image, the reader has to interact with the text and build his own mental images or her own mental images. But images enable us to do things we couldn't do before, and the new technologies, whether in the life sciences or otherwise, we have 3D uh, transparency ability to see through four old x-rays. We have the ability with images to go down to things that we cannot even see with our naked eye. We have the possibility of going beyond the visible light. This is a thermal imagery that captures temperature and therefore we can see things that we couldn't see otherwise, like that this engine is hot in this part here, or that this person is suffering from this tomography, as you can see here. We can communicate things that we could never communicate. This happens to be the Tokyo uh, subway. Imagine trying to describe that in text. It is not possible. So we need these images and these maps, and for every city, I mean, this is something. So. The notion of image and text as a way of structuring and communicating knowledge is changing because images are becoming so easy, so simple to use, and so on. And of course, I've never been in space, but I've vicariously enjoyed the experience of the astronauts through the images that they were taking and communicating back to Earth. And all of that enables us to expand our horizons, whether we go underwater to deep areas or into uh, space or so on, we see things we couldn't see before. So images under the new technologies are going to be enable us to communicate in ways we couldn't communicate before. Third pillar is really about the relationship between humans and machines. And I believe Kevin Warwick will be coming back to us again. I think he's the first human cyborg who actually embedded a chip into his arm and communicates directly, but we now have brain-machine interface as you know, thought reading is now possible. But here's my statement. With the exception of pure math and some areas of philosophy, like reflections on the purpose of life and the meaning of the universe, in every other field of knowledge, social sciences, literature, geography, history, it will be impossible for human beings to search, find, access, and collect this information, much less add to the information and put up their own. We will need machine mediation. It's not good or bad, it just is. We cannot access information anymore 
without machines. We need a lot more machines. Why? Because there's so much of it. And it's constantly changing, and therefore the only way I can access information now, even if I want to, to write about topic A, I have to find out what other people have said about topic A. And that involves an enormous capacity for search that only machines can do. And it's not just the ubiquitous computer, but it's being replaced by supercomputers, handheld devices, parallel calculations, and all of that. And as I mentioned earlier on, effective machine translation is effective. There is some machine translation, but it will be effective machine translation, and it's coming soon, very soon. Now, all of this is going to expand the brain's reach beyond anything our parents could imagine. And there is really that break, that transformative break that justifies calling it a true revolution. Now, while this is going on, the other side of machine-human interface is not just to be able to read the thoughts of humans, it's a question of also whether we can or cannot or how far we are going towards the building of artificial intelligence and the emergence qualities of consciousness. Who knows? So people say that today the human brain is about a million times more powerful than the most powerful computers. Well, computers are gaining power every day. What happens when the computers are a million times more powerful than human brains? Who knows what will happen? But that's just another of these areas. The fourth area is complexity and chaos. I think we all recognize that our lives are now incredibly complex. The world we live in is incredibly complex, and thus that we will probably need a new mathematics to deal with it. It's also chaotic, chaotic in the scientific sense that it has uh, nonlinear feedback loops and therefore makes the prediction of a particular position of a system at a certain time in the future extremely difficult or subject to enormous uncertainties. And these new mathematical tools will be required for the next round of innovations as I believe it to be. And that brings me to the fifth pillar, which is computation and research. Now, until now, computers of course have done marvelous things, but most Scientists have just considered that computers are there as very fast, very powerful, but fairly dumb calculating machines. I submit to you that in this new revolution, it is not just the mathematics or the understanding in science, it shall be concepts and theorems and tools coming from computational sciences and information theory are going to in, be injected into the scientific research paradigm. Well, let me give you an example. We are now increasingly changing our approach where we've always been building data collections in science. We were building collections of everything. Now we are looking at connections between collections of data. And that requires different kinds of ways of thinking and tools. And who's been doing a lot of time thinking about that? It's our colleagues in the computing sciences and information theory fields. So some of these concepts, just like statistical concepts, have found their way into physics, quantum physics, and elsewhere, and in the natural sciences and in the social sciences. I think increasingly ideas and theorems from computational sciences will come into uh, the world that we think of. Already these things are leading to new ideas, everything from new computer architecture to new pathways, new clusters, new network controls, neural nets, multidimensional manifolds, virtual communities, real communities, and who knows where tomorrow will take us. But it's very rapidly changing, and I think that we will see in the new research paradigm uh, that particular side of it from information computational science coming in. The sixth pillar is convergence and transformation. By that I mean that on one thing we used at one point to have uh, chemistry and we used to have biology and we have biochemistry. That's an easy one to, for everybody to relate to. Well, now I believe we are living the era of BINT, which in Arabic is a good acronym, it says girl, but in fact it's bio-info nanotechnologies because these fields are beginning to converge. And as a result, this becomes a very exciting and fertile ground in which new ideas will be formed, presented, and new concepts and new technologies will emerge 
that is going to impact on our societies in a very big way. But the second part is what I call transformative research. The NSF actually used that term. Uh, to, uh, these, this is research that changes the paradigm in some fields. So in biology, for example, the discovery of the structure of DNA rightly is hailed as, uh, of course, there were prior uh, activities and post activities, but it's hailed as a milestone. And maybe today, synthetic biology will be an area that will be equally powerful and transformative. The question is whether with all these other tools I was talking about, we will be able to promote transformative research and not just let it happen when it happens. Uh, this transformative research, I believe, can be nurtured if we understand the way the structure of knowledge is changing and the societies that will master that first will be the ones that will be able to move fastest and maybe even the gap will grow. The seventh pillar of this transformation is pluridisciplinarity and policy. In this complex world, in this world that is increasingly chaotic, in this world where our actions are having an important effect on the environment and the environment and the ecological balance are themselves very complex systems, biological systems are very complex, brain systems, neural systems are extremely complex, all of that increasingly to, to be able to do proper policy requires multidisciplinarity. We need the wisdom of the humanities and the ability of the social sciences tied to the natural sciences to be able to forge together ideas that make sense and policies that will be effective. Now there are different ways of doing that, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, but I won't spend time discussing that, but I will simply say that the implications of these seven pillars is that we are actively inventing the future at present. In 2009, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Internet, one of the most transformative technologies ever. And here in the Library of Alexandria, we welcomed one of the fathers uh, of the Internet. I consider three people have contributed most to it. And uh, that was when the first message was sent from San Francisco to Los Angeles and was recorded and logged in. And you know what the first message was? ever, one computer talking to another in what would later first become the ARPANET, then later the Internet, it was LO. And basically, they were trying to write log on. And it crashed after LO, but the LO went through. And that was recorded, it was celebrated a couple of years ago, and Vint Cerf, one of the fathers of that, was here with us in the Library of Alexandria, and he works with us on the super course on science, which will be presented to you later in BioVision. As Vint Cerf, right here in the Library of Alexandria, and Bob Kane, both of them invented the TCP IP, the Internet Protocol, that is the foundation of how the system works. And Tim Berners-Lee invented the WWW, the World Wide Web, and uh, the HTML. But, but fundamentally, I think those three guys did more to transform the world than any political figure or any military figure. It has permeated our lives in ways nobody could imagine. Certainly not, I mean, Vint himself admits it. Nobody imagined that it would be so transformative of everything from banking systems to purchasing to social connectivity, etc. Today, it has become the primary tools of access to knowledge and self-expression. There's an enormous amount of information, but of very variable quality. It allows us to communicate with each other at the speed of light around the Earth. And thanks to these young people who invented Google, not only we have a search engine, but uh, they actually, uh, with their digitization program, they're putting so much of our past written text heritage into this digital domain that undoubtedly when all the various legal points are sorted out, it will have a major impact on availability of that information. And the creative individuals and the private sector have reinvented the world with these new business models. Apple iTunes, the old recording companies were fighting the users, the consumers, and suing them. And Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs, invented the iPod. 
and he was able therefore to give people a model through iTunes where you can download legally. You pay a small fee and then the iPhone and the iPad, electronic books are all coming back in a big way using iPad, Kindle and other things using the iTunes business model. My friends, much as I love books, October 2010 was the first bookless library. This was in the engineering school of the University of Texas, San Antonio, which has 425,000 books online and 18,000 electronic journals. And they just removed all the books from the shelves and allow people, as you can see this person here using computers, terminals, and their librarians go around with iPads and they're buzzed and they come and discuss things with iPads. Apparently, I believe that we need both books and uh, the electronic versions of it, but clearly the future is electronic. Open Content Alliances also has digitization program. And today, we in the Library of Alexandria, I'm come to the Library of Alexandria, what we do to, to respond to that, we are building up our uh, electronic resources, our e-resources. But it puts at your fingertips the knowledge of the world. Already Harold Varmus, also who came and honored us in past meetings, spoke and he was one of the big supporters of the Public Library of Science, saying all knowledge should be put online. And that's wonderful because it is, in fact, uh, uh, putting for free top scientific research. But we're still posting articles that look very much like articles, not the kind that I'm talking about. As problems for us librarians and archivists of dealing with the preservation of digital content from technical obsolescence to physical obsolescence. But where this used to be the old style of storage of information, actually comparably well organized to the Dar al-Mahfuzat on which I'm working with the uh, uh, government authorities, this is still reasonably well organized. This is, of course, what the new archives look like. This is the Internet Archive. One of these racks, one of these racks, if you take a book of 300 pages and you digitize it as text, one of these racks could carry 100 million books. And in fact, if it has lots of images and pictures and colors, you could carry 12 million. So all these new forms of storage are coming about. And whereas this was the old style retrieval of information, this is the new style retrieval of information but that's at the beginning of the 21st century. Pretty soon, this interface with the keyboard is going to change itself. But the digital future is already here, and I invite you to cross the plaza and go into the Library of Alexandria. That's a wonderful library, that reading room that we have there. The Internet Archive will be on your right. You go down into this beautiful space with all the books that are there to read. And on your left is an exhibition of what we are doing in cutting edge ICT technology with our partners from the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, to the National Academy of Science and the EOL and other things of that nature. So change is happening with incredible speed because of these seven pillars and therefore we can ask, well, since you know all this stuff and you're telling us about this, what are you doing about it in the Library of Alexandria? Good enough and I'll tell you. The purpose of the library is really to recapture the spirit of the ancient library. So it's not just to stay as a virtual library, but it's a combination of things. We have a landmark building, we have a hive of activities, we have multiple institutions and libraries and museums and galleries and research institutes. And the building, you know it well, I'm not going to tell you about it since you're in it. Actually you are in the conference center. And this is the university with which we are so closely associated in everything we do. And these two streets are important. They play a role in the revolution uh, uh, that I will talk to. And as you will note, the library has no walls, no gates. And this is where the demonstrations went during the revolution and still go till today. And the doors of the library building and of the conference center are of glass, and that's important. This is our reading room, and you're welcome to go and visit it. It's stunning architecture. This is the conference center, but that's not really the importance. The importance of the building is the activities that go on in it. And the fact that we are really open to the public, and we want to reach the public. And we have more than a million visitors annually, and we have lots of special children's programs and reader visits. 
but our websites, we are actually receiving on our websites well over 600 million hits per year, and today we are averaging more than 2 million hits every single day. But almost half of that is from inside Egypt. So this is quite impressive. It's not just the number of physical human visitors who come. If you have 2 million hits every day, that's pretty impressive and it's growing. We hold events, and this is one of them, and the one you're in right now, and about 700 of these a year. This last year, we'll have a little more than 650. Not counting the educational courses, art school activities. Uh, this year, we didn't have our annual book fair, but we hope to hold it again next year. Uh, we have multiple institutions dedicated to learning, communication, dialogue, and understanding. We're committed to the arts as well as to the sciences. And we have libraries. Our library, as I mentioned, is a hybrid library. Yes, we have a million three hundred thousand books of various types, but we have a lot of electronic resources and they're growing very rapidly. And about almost one half of our annual budget on libraries is going to electronic databases and resources. And that's why you'll see everywhere we have computers. This is a slightly older picture because now all of these have been replaced with flat screens. But nevertheless, it's the same. We have specialized libraries, uh, the Tahseen Library for the Visually Impaired, and there are special programs designed by the people who are running that library for the visually impaired. Children's Library, Young Persons Library, Multimedia Library, Rare Books Library, as well as Microforms and Map Library. All of these are among the specialized libraries that we have plus, of course, the Internet Archive. And that's Booster Kale, the inventor of the Internet Archive, where the original is in San Francisco, and that's the archive I mentioned to you. We have 19 museums and permanent art galleries. 19, four of them, the Sadat Museum, and we have the Manuscript Museum, and we have an Antiquities Museum with donations from all the museums of Egypt throughout its history, and we have a science museum, history of science museum, combined with a planetarium and exploratorium. And this is in the science museum where we explain the long history and contribution of ancient Egypt, ancient Alexandria, the Muslim and the Arab worlds, and the contemporary world. Planetarium allows people to see things in ways they wouldn't have seen otherwise. But the Al Exploratorium, which is where children get the chance to do hands-on experimentation and playing around is where really people learn that the, the journey of discovery is the excitement that we call science, that it is not about learning facts, it is about discovering for yourself. And it encourages people to ask what if. And our annual BA Science Festival, which uh, uh, last year had reached about 20,000 people, it's really nice. I mean, to me, this is one of the nicest pictures because it shows the children are having a wonderful time. And science should be exciting and enjoyable. And that's the future. These are our future, Egypt's future, Arab world's future. So we had three days, uh, 20,000 visitors. We have 15 permanent exhibitions and galleries dealing with everything from Shadi Abdul Salam to the Mohaddin Hussein collection to Adam Hanin collection to Abdul Wahab collection, etc and the folkloric art collection of the late Ryan Nimr, and 10 more of these, plus four galleries for temporary exhibitions, both for art and science. And we have research institutes. We have eight research institutes, and what was a forum for discussion and dialogue, which is now being transformed into a development uh, research institution. So we have manuscripts, the calligraphy and writing, special studies, organizer of this event where we are, we have documentation center that produced, that's in Cairo, and that produced the Culturama, which you can see here, which is the first nine screen interactive presentation. That's our institution in Cairo. ISIS, that you should see the, the exhibition that they have at the left-hand side when you enter the library. Our art center, the Center for Alexandria and the Mediterranean, the Center for Hellenistic Studies, which is our first degree-giving program in Masters and PhD with the University of Alexandria. And finally, we had a dialogue forum, which has now been replaced or transformed by a Center for Development Studies because of 
Egypt's many problems right now, we need to focus on problems of employment, problems of environment, problems of a lot of other problems. All of these centers really are about mobilizing Egypt's intellectuals as well as producing research, whether it is online or in publications. Uh, so that's how we recognize that knowledge is not going to be compartmentalized and we say we focus only on this knowledge. All sides of knowledge are weaving into each other and we deal with everything. We deal with everything in the sense that learning is not just through books in a library, but it's through interaction and interaction in many different forms. And that's why we have these enormous digital resources. We have created digital archives for Nasser and Sadat and Butros Ghali and the Hilal magazine, the uh, Suez Canal Company, two and a half million documents are now online here, and all of that. The Nasser alone has 50,000 pictures, 1,000 portraits, 1,400, uh, uh, you can hear his voice as well as read the text of all his speeches, etc., etc., for everyone, and all of that is interactively connected. And as I mentioned, the Suez Canal documents have two and a half million. And we now have actually close to 180,000 books in Arabic online that you can get inside the library, 20,000 of which you can read fully from outside the library. The rest you can only get 5% because they're copyright issues. But when you are inside, you can read them and they are searchable, which is a very important tool because you can search for a particular word in all of these books and then find them immediately and know whether or not such and such a topic is in that book or not in that book before you take the book and spend the time going through the entire, uh, uh, well, mind you, I mean, it's always useful to learn and read something new, but uh, <laughs> you may say, oh my God, you know, I'm not finding what I needed here. We've created the memory of modern Egypt in addition to Eternal Egypt, which is another website. Uh, the memory of modern Egypt deals with only the last uh, 200 years and it's like a world digital library for Egypt in Arabic. And we have enormous analytical work that is presented here as in this conference, as for example with biorobotics. And Maggie Kathleen Carson will remember this little guy here, uh, his name was Nao. And uh, we also uh, do our own work, which you can see on exhibition in virtual reality programs, to supercomputing, all of that is here. So the digital future is here in the Library of Alexandria, very present in addition to our collections of books and the more traditional functions we do. Why? Because we are committed to access to all information for all people at all times. So that is the guiding mantra with which we recognize this knowledge revolution that is taking place before us right now. And we recognize that we are part of these little dots that together constitute global knowledge. And global knowledge is what is being transformed all the time. And that's what expands the brain's reach through these tools that I've been talking about before. And in the future, as librarians and archivists, we can think of organizing knowledge differently. Uh, this map is well known. It's a map that was published in the New York Times. It shows you a totally different structure of presenting the communication between fields of knowledge than the traditional classifications that we've been using in archives and in libraries, Dewey Decimal, Library of Congress classification, etc. Now, this new world, I submit, will give us a chance not only to search and drill into knowledge in new ways, but will give us a chance to think about the relationship between fields of knowledge differently. This is a map of the social sciences. With every map, this is done by Eigenfactor, every field, the amount of self-referencing, and the yellow is external referencing, and the arrows is the, the thickness of the arrows shows the amount of interconnectivity between the fields. So we have particular links in the fields, and this is in the natural sciences. Uh, so medicine and molecular cell biology are particularly strong, and so is you know, neuroscience, etc., etc. Physics is up here. So there's a different way of thinking about how to organize knowledge. And beyond the conventional keyboards, we've already now gone into the areas of augmented reality and where we can provide information when and where it's needed, like in this case, for a doctor in an emergency area, you can send the patient's records immediately to uh, their handheld device. Now, that of course is on the knowledge side, but we also want to be an activist organization. 
with outreach and defending values and outreach in the universities. And Dr. Salah Suleiman has a number of the Safwa groups in various universities, and these are trips we used to organize. Into the schools, we have an experiment in outreach called the mobile, uh, book mobile that goes, takes electronic devices to the schools. We've created 200 and going towards 300 science clubs in Alexandria in, in high schools around Alexandria. Not to mention that we don't ignore the arts either, art programs for children. There's been a massive expansion of our science clubs and our science fairs, and of course, the expansion of science competitions. And I'm very proud of the fact that some of the poorest people won our scientists' competition. And in fact, the last year, it was people from Asyut, not from Cairo or Alexandria, who won the national competition we organized. We do programs for young inventors, and we decided that we needed TV programs, so we have TV science programs that we present in various things. And in all of that, we are interacting with society in a broader sense to encourage people to debate and discuss. Some years ago, we drafted the first major declaration, the so-called Alexandria Declaration uh, for Arab Reform, which was in March 2004. And we used this podium in many of our conferences to encourage people towards rationality, discussion, freedom of expression. In fact, this is a program launched by Norway. And it's the beacon for freedom of expression, and it's dedicated to the new Library of Alexandria, this place, because they consider us the custodians of freedom of expression. These are the forums, the youth forums we did, plenary debates, audience participation, internet connectivity, all of that. So we see this holistic view of this transformative knowledge structure being reflected in the institutions that communicate with the public and serve the public to present all the tools of knowledge. So all the parts are essential and they reinforce each other and why I believe the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Now we're just starting. We're not yet 10 years old. So you can see, I mean, we're barely starting. But I'm very, very proud of our young people in the library and in Alexandria. And so for our guests from everywhere, of course, we are living through a great revolution in Egypt, the 25th of January revolution, famous for Tahrir Square around the world. There's Tahrir Square empty, Tahrir Square with demonstrations by day, by night, in prayer, in confrontation, and it's impacted the whole world. It's been followed by the whole world. And let me show you a few pictures from Wisconsin. Egypt, Wisconsin, fight like an Egyptian. <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> Egypt help us in Wisconsin. <laughs> Egypt supports Wisconsin. So uh, Egypt showed the way. So, uh, you know, all of this is fabulous. What happened in the Library of Alexandria? Well, people have all, of course, the news focused on, on, on Tahrir Square. But this is the demonstrations in Alexandria. They weren't exactly small. I mean, television and news media is in Cairo. But nevertheless, this, as you well know, is here. This is the Corniche towards the, the, to the west of us a little bit. And that was this street for our guests outside when you go over on that side. Now, I must confess, I was here on the 25th with a few colleagues, and we were waiting and on the 28th, on the other days as well, and we were seeing this huge mass of people coming, not knowing what would happen, and then suddenly, in the most exciting and exalting moment of my life, the young people held hands together from the demonstration. These are people demonstrating against the, the, the Mubarak regime, and they are creating this, just this human wall with no, there's no weapons, no nothing. Silmiya, Silmiya, 100%. They're just holding rolls of paper. And the, the crowds respected that. And there are the crowds on the other side that you can see. Prayer time was very orderly. There was no disruption of any kind. The other hand, the, the, the police headquarters, the party, and the government house a few blocks away were all destroyed. Then the young people did this beautiful flag. They wrapped the library in it and uh, came and exhibited. And it was a wonderful moment. It was a validation 
of the work. And this is on the other side. And again, you will notice here they are holding hands and creating this line that you see. And these are the demonstrations passing through Port Said Street. So this has been really an exciting uh, uh, transformative moment, exalting moment. And this became, these steps have become favorite demonstration places for everybody, whatever their issues. Recently, we had people about Syria, about other issues who come here. And uh, uh, eight years of hard work not only have created this clear contrast between the two, but have given me the, and my colleagues here the greatest vote of confidence by the young people who use the library. And in that particular drawing they did, which is actually is close to Mandara near uh, Montaza in Eastern Alexandria, and where they, you have the three pyramids and the library as a fourth pyramid, and this is dedicated to the martyrs of the revolution by the, the youth of the 25th of January. I don't know who held hands. I don't know who painted that. But whoever they are, I'm grateful for your vote of confidence. And I say that we will do our best to continue to serve you as much as we can. Actually, this story for people who saw it inspired them to produce this book in the United States. Now, as you well know, we are very proud of our people. We are very proud of our people because even when we had disagreements in our family in the Library of Alexandria, and you all know that we have had these disagreements, not a stone was thrown at the library. And there has been no violence, no wounded demonstrators. And I'm grateful for all, whatever the points of views of disagreements have been, we are still you know, a place for openness, dialogue, and rationality. But now I want to say, because people are very worried about what they see as an Islamic tide, and people in the international press are talking about these things and as if somehow this was going to be a disaster. And I want to remind them about Islam and science and our values. Now, in the Middle Ages, the Arab Islamic world was coming into its own. Iran and Central Asia played pivotal roles. And in that huge empire, the lost knowledge when the old Library of Alexandria was destroyed was regathered. How? By a person who was half Iranian, half Arab, all Muslim, Al Ma'mun ibn Harun al Rashid, who was the, the Khalifa in Baghdad at the time of the Abbasid Empire. And he created Bayt al Hikmah with enormous support for learning from these enormous programs, a huge translation program that in 70 years would make Arabic the language of learning. But as a byproduct, he reassembled all the lost manuscripts of the world because he paid the, the, anybody who would translate a manuscript, he would give them their weight in gold. So anybody who had a manuscript in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, elsewhere would go, no Morocco wasn't included, but anywhere, would go to Baghdad, have the book translated, and get its weight in gold. And pretty soon, the equivalent of his Minister of Finance told him the scholars are cheating. They are writing in big letters on thick paper. <laughs> to which Al-Ma'mun said, let them be, for what they give us is so much more valuable than the mere coins we give them. Such was the wisdom at the time. And as I said, in 70 years, it transformed uh, uh, the language of learning became Arabic rather than Greek. And all the old wisdom was translated, and many of it was kept in Arabic, and then later on retranslated into Latin from the Arabic. This is, of course, the Pythagorean theorem in an Arabic text, an Iranian text. This is uh, a text uh, from the, uh, the Galen, or Galinos, as we call him in Arabic, a medical figure of 180 AD, the this medicinal plants. And this is a medieval library in these manuscripts. These are the books. You see all the books there. And there are the scholars. And there's reading a book and arguing about it. And uh, astronomy, mathematics, etc., flourished. In fact, the so-called Arabic numerals, which were brought from uh, uh, India, adopted by the Arabs. And the Europeans took them from the Arabs. And that's why they refer to them as Arabic numerals. And as a result, this is a way showing this, the, the superiority of the numerical system over the abacus. It was 
an enormous explosion of science in the ninth century with all of these figures, um, Jabir ibn Hayyan, and, and Tabari, and Razi, Farabi, and uh, Zahrawi, and uh, all of these people. And then another explosion in the 10th or the 13th century from Burjani in mathematics and astronomy to Biruni. Biruni, who is originally uh, Persian, said in one of his writings, I cannot imagine writing in any language other than Arabic, for it is the language of knowledge and science. So said al-Biruni in a wonderful, actually, treatise about India, which he visited. And the great Ibn Sina, whose work has remi remained the canonical work, in fact, al-Qanun is what the canon, when we say the canon of particular knowledge, it comes from that book. Omar Khayyam, famous for his poetry, was a very distinguished mathematician and astronomer. The poetry was on the side, the quatrains are on the side. In Arabic, we know them from the translations of Rami and the singing of Umm Kulthum, but in fact, Rubaiyat uh, al-Khayyam, but in fact, uh, and in English, of course, we know it from Fitzgerald's translation, but in fact, he was a very distinguished mathematician and astronomer, and he did a better uh, uh, calendrical system than the Gregorian system uh, almost four centuries earlier. But he's still remembered mostly for his beautiful poetry. Al-Tusi, the dean of astronomy and with the Tusi couple, and among other things, he confronted Hulagu, the man who destroyed Baghdad, and told him that he had to invest in science. And Hulagu agreed with him and invested in creating Al Maragha school in what is today Western Iran. This is Maragha Observatory. Khwarizmi, who, whose name is, uh, derives into algorithm as well as from his book, Kitab al Jabr wal Muqabala, gives us the word algebra. All of these people, that's Kitab al Khwarizmi, and is a very distinguished mathematician and astronomer. Ibn Khaldun, a remarkable Renaissance man, we celebrated here. Uh, his uh, 600th anniversary. Uh, uh, he, uh, anniversary of his death, he lived the last 22 years of his life here in Egypt. And uh, his Muqaddama remains one of the great works and his many, many consider him the father of sociology. But Ibn al-Haytham, who was born in Basra and lived in, in Cairo, he actually uh, is the father of the modern empirical scientific method and Bruce Arbus and I had exchanges on this some time ago, he challenged the authority of the ancients. Now, the authority of the ancients in their day meant Aristotle. So he was challenging Aristotle. People would say, Aristotle has said, and therefore the subject is closed. Well, he said, no, we have science and we have observation. That's what we do. So he relied on experiment rather than on past authority. And he said, he who searches for truth is not he who reviews the works of the ancients. It is he who follows argument and evidence, not statement by an individual who is inevitably affected by context and imperfection. Shukuk al Platonos. He did a lot of work on optics, and among other things, he analyzed the human eye, and he also said that actually we see because a ray of light comes into our eyes, not because our eyes send something out. But listen to that description of the modern scientific method. We start by observing reality. We try to select solid and unchanging observations that are not affected by how we perceive or measure them. We then proceed by increasing our research and measurement, subjecting premises to criticism, and being cautious in drawing conclusion. In all we do, our purpose should be balanced, not arbitrary, the search for truth, not support of opinions. Now this was written at the end of the 10th century, the beginning of the 11th, a full 600 years before Galileo and Descartes. And uh, what is impressive, of course, is that Ibn al-Haytham, who died in 1040, he articulated that Gal he didn't suffer for it, but Galileo did in 1633, as we all know, in the famous trial when he had to recant. Listen to Ibn al-Nafis in the 13th century, what does he say about the contrarian view, the unexpected? Robin Warren, where are you? Mr. Warren, who told us about gastric ulcers being <laughs> an infection of <laughs> helicobacter. Uh, when hearing something unusual, do not preemptively reject it, for that would be folly. The Arabic word is taish. 
Indeed, the horrible things may be true, and familiar and praised things may prove to be lies. Truth is truth unto itself, not because many people say it is. So they were open to all the ideas, open to discussion, open to new challenges, only accepting what is supported by argument and evidence. And Egypt itself would flourish in that period. And of course, we have these beautiful astrolabs, which you can see here, as remnants of that wonderful medieval period when Europe was still in the Dark Ages. And here, in this side of the Mediterranean, stretching from India all the way to Spain, there was this wonderful, open, tolerant exchange of ideas with, with uh, all nationalities and religions. In Egypt, regretfully, thugs burnt the Institut d'Egypte, Magma al-Almi. This is one of the oldest academies in the world. It dates from 1798. And uh, it had old collections and old manuscripts, some of which have been destroyed beyond salvage. This is the, a copy of the famous uh, Description de l'Egypte, was from Astra. These are other copies. It was a witness to Egypt's modern science. Even though it was closed briefly during the time of Muhammad Ali, Rifaat Tahtawi, Ali Mubarak, and others recaptured it. In the 20th century, eminent people like Ali Musharrafa and Ali Ibrahim and others played a central role, including Ta Hussein, who was at one point both the founding rector of Alexandria University and the president of the Institut d'Egypte. And today, it uh, counts among its distinguished members, scientists like Farouk El Baz, Ahmad Zouel, and Magdi Aoub who also has a program, for those of you who don't know, about HCM that is run in a lab that is sponsored by the Library of Alexandria here. So to revive the tradition of linking science to society, we had a wonderful tradition to look to. And despite the turmoil and what happened to the Institut d'Egypte, we had very successful elections that were largely peaceful. And the blocks in the parliament tended to be uh, the Islamic blocs. But there is a tradition in Islam that I've just been talking about. The tradition that held up science, that held up openness, that held up discussion, that believed in experiment and evidence. And we need to revive that. And I'm happy to say that we have been publishing some of the great works of the last 200 years. And I've been discussing with the Sheikh Al-Azhar about the importance of reviving that side of the tradition and not exclusively focusing on uh, the other side of the tradition. And Wasiqat al-Azhar, as you know, has been one of the efforts. But what we have been doing is reissuing the classics. We've issued 40 titles so far. They're available. 22 of them are already available in CDs if you want them, and the rest will be, are online. And in all of this, what we end up with is that there were values that enabled scientists to work. They were the values that enabled our forefathers in the Muslim world to hold up the torch of knowledge. They were the values that were maintained by the ancient library of Alexandria. And they are the values that the new library of Alexandria tries to maintain in its international contacts and conferences. The first of these values for the practice of science is the commitment to truth. No scientist can be respected if they fabricate their data. The second is honor. You don't take somebody else's work and put your name on it. That plagiarism is the second worst crime. But we respect creativity and imagination. It is not just additive leaps of the imagination on Einstein, Newton, etc. And we have in science a constructive subversiveness. The knowledge of science is expected to change. Otherwise, there would be no scientific progress. And thus, we must expect to challenge and to receive challenges by very young people. Einstein was 26 when he advanced his theory of relativity and the quantum physics that he advanced. So did Dirac, so did Heisenberg, so all of these people. Jim Watson was only 25 when he and, and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA. And that requires what Ibn Nafis was talking about, tolerance of engagement with any view, no matter how unusual it is and arbitration of disputes by evidence, by rational argument and evidence. Now, these are the values of science, but they are also the values for a humane and able society. 
And thus, my friends, as we meet and you're about to see how science that promotes and builds itself on these values links to society, remember that these values are an inherent part of society and that the knowledge that is represented by the scientific knowledge is part of that enormous transformation and it is itself transforming the knowledge structure of the world into this incredible knowledge revolution we are living through. And we in the library are proud to join you all as artisans of a better future for Egypt and for the world and working all together. There is so much we will be able to do for the whole generation of young people whose pictures I've shown and for the whole world. And I thank you for your attention.